This is a brief demonstration of some of the information delivery capabilities of an OLAP cube that I have built based on a multi-dimensional data warehouse constructed from patent documents published by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office over the decade extending from 2001 through 2011. The data warehouse contains uh, a little over 539,000 such documents. Here we're looking at Microsoft Excel, which I'm using as my cube browser. In order to connect to the cube, I'm going to click this macro button here. I've written that macro, which just simplifies the connection procedure. Now, we can see over on the right-hand side here, uh, the um, Th these units with uh, sigma symbols in front of them are the various so-called measures. These define the information uh, quanta that we can get from the cube. And as I scroll down, you will see various dimensions, as they are called. Here's an agent dimension, an applicant dimension, um, a classification dimension, various date dimensions. There are many date dimensions in this cube because, of course, in the patent uh, uh, profession, uh, dates are exceedingly important. This particular dimension corresponds to the Canadian National Phase Entry Date of a PCT, or Patent Cooperation Treaty, patent application. We have a document dimension. There's a, another date dimension corresponding to the date on which a substantive examination of a Canadian patent application is requested. We have an inventor dimension, we have an owner dimension, and various other date dimensions. Well, the way that we make use of the cube is by selecting various measures and uh, uh, dimensions. So, for example, I'm going to choose initially the number of documents uh, as a measure, and you can see in the top left corner here, I get this number, 539,115. That number represents the total number of Canadian patent documents uh, stored, or for which information is stored in the cube. Now, that number by itself is not very interesting, but we can make it a bit more interesting by bringing in some of that dimensional information. So, for example, if I take the document by kind dimension and just drag it down to columns here, we can see that the display in the top left area is immediately reconfigured to show us the number of documents in each of the four uh, kind code categories represented in the cube. Uh, we can then add further dimensions. For example, I'll scroll down here and I will choose the publication date dimension. You'll notice there's two versions of each date dimension. There's a calendar year version and a fiscal year version. The Canadian Intellectual Property Office has a fiscal year that commences on April 1 in each year. Uh, in many cases in this demo, I'm just going to choose the calendar date dimension, but you could easily choose fiscal. You'll notice that as soon as I bring in the publication date dimension, the table, the pivot table displayed by Excel, is immediately reconfigured, giving us a calendar year breakdown for each of the document kind codes. And of course, uh, one of the things that Excel is very good at doing is producing graphs, and that's no exception for uh, information derived from a cube. I can uh, easily bring in a so-called pivot chart just by clicking the pivot chart button. I'll leave it on the default chart type and just click OK. There you immediately have a chart uh, showing you the um, uh, breakdown of information as we see in the pivot table on the left. Um, maybe this isn't quite the display of information that you were looking for. Maybe instead of documents by kind code, what you're really interested in is documents by filing type. So I can just drag the 
kind code document out of the way um, dimension out of the way you'll see the chart and the table immediately reconfigure and then I'll just grab the document by type dimension bring it down on columns and bang immediately the table and the chart are reconfigured now we're looking at documents by filing type and of course there's two such types you can either directly file an application in, uh, in the Canadian uh, Intellectual Property Office, that's a non-PCT uh, case, or you can come into the Canadian National Phase via the Patent Cooperation Treaty. And here we see both of those breakdowns uh, in both the uh, pivot uh, chart and the pivot table on the left. We can also add further um, information here by clicking the insert slicer button I can choose to slice the information further what I'm going to pick this time and what we're seeing here again is just the dimensions that I scrolled through on the right hand side of the screen earlier let's choose the issue date dimension as our slicer and I'll, I'll pick the calendar year as an example takes it a moment to bring up the slicer. Here it is. Initially all calendar years are chosen, but I'm sorry I've scrolled too far. Maybe we only want to look at, let's say, uh, cases that issued in calendar year 2008. So I'll click that and you'll see that immediately the chart and the table are reconfigured. Now we're looking only at information pertaining to Canadian patents which issued in calendar year 2008 or if I wanted 2007 I can click it or 2006 or maybe I want all three of those years I'll just hold down the shift key and click all three years and there they are um, we can have if we wish uh, multiple slicers so I'll choose another slicer here and how about this time let's look at the applicant nationality as a, a slicer here are all the different ap applicant nationalities as I scroll through the slicer you might think oh a particular country that you can name is not indicated in the slicer well, what you are seeing here, and this is the way that uh, OLAP cubes and uh, multi-dimensional data warehouses work, uh, only information which actually exists in the cube um, appears here. So we know, what, because we see Egypt, that there's at least one case involving an applicant having Egypt as its nationality represented in the cube, so on and so forth. Well let's pick Canada and okay now you can see that the chart and the pivot table on the left have been reconfigured we're now seeing only uh, cases involving applicants having Canadian nationality which issued in any of these three years highlighted in this slicer um, and the, they're broken down by PCT and non PCT maybe you'd rather look at Brazil so I'll just click Brazil here and there's Brazil or maybe you'd rather look at uh, the United States of America I'll click the USA and it takes it a moment to think things through but here's the USA data again corresponding to what I've chosen on the slicers here as we go through the demo please bear in mind that you can use pivot charts and slicers at any point uh, while you're working with a cube I'll just get rid of the chart and I'll get rid of these slicers and we'll carry on with some other aspects of uh, the demo let's for example go back and get that applicant uh, by nationality dimension and I'll bring this down to the filter as it is called and you can see up here uh, we've got uh, a filter it's 
it's remembered that the last thing that we looked at was the United States of America. Well, maybe we don't want to look at the United States of America. I'll just expand that out. Instead, maybe we want to look at, um, oh, let's try South Korea, which you can see right here. Well, if I expand South Korea, you'll see that now we're seeing all of the entities which are applicants having South Korean nationality uh, and for which there is at least one Canadian patent document represented in the cube. I'll just scroll down here. I'm going to pick LG Electronics, who you may be familiar with, a fairly famous appliance uh, manufacturer. You can see we've got a number of entries for LG Electronics here, and they all look the same uh, or very similar. The reason we have a multiplicity of them has to do with the fact that different address information was provided for each of these uh, in the patent applications presented to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Maybe uh, LG changed its address, maybe um, different agents chose different um, abbreviations for various components of the address, different formatting, maybe clerical uh, personnel within the CIPO processed the uh, or entered the data differently, but in any case we can choose them all as you can see here. And when I click OK, bang, there we have uh, the um, uh, Q, uh, cube re immediately reconfigured to show information this time only pertaining to cases from uh, LG Electronics. Now we can take that a bit further. We can actually drill down uh, within the cube here and uh, to make this slightly more interesting I'm going to go back to our document dimension. There it was. I'll get rid of kind code, excuse me, uh, type, and instead I'll bring back kind, which we had before, and you can see now the breakdown as between late open patent applications uh, in this column and issued Canadian patents in this column. We can further drill down through the years, and this also is true in the fiscal date dimensions. Uh, I might, for example, want to come down into May of 2005 and you can see here that it's indicating we've got uh, one Canadian patent granted on the 24th of May 2005. Well, if I expand the issued um, um, uh, datum up at the top there, you can see that along the columns we've got all of the Canadian patent numbers. To find the one corresponding here, I am just going to scroll horizontally, see if we can pick that one up, figure out where it is. There it is, right there, and this is it. Um, if I right-click on it and then choose down here Additional Actions, I've built in a interesting little feature. I can just open up the Canadian Intellectual Property Office's online uh, database and there's that particular patent. Just bring this down again so that you can see that indeed it is. If we scroll down we will see that yes indeed this is a Canadian patent document uh, granted to LG Electronics Inc. and we can see that the issue date in this case happens to be the 17th of August 2010. Let's just go back along our row here and I can see, yeah, I probably managed to confuse myself as to the one that we were looking for when I was the 24th of May, I think. Although, let's just go back and remember something. Yes, there we are. That's what we need to look at because remember that the dimension that we are seeing on the rows here is the publication date.
dimension. It's not the issue date dimension. There you can see the publication date dimension on rows. Just come back to this. I'll recollapse this. Um, collapse that. I'll now just get rid of these and see if I can show you some of the other interesting things that one can do with a cube. Um, I'll bring back the applicant nationality hierarchy from the uh, applicant dimension. I'll just scroll up slowly so that you can see things as I go. And let's just pick the applicant by nationality hierarchy. You can see over here that it remembers that we were looking at Korea. Well, we don't necessarily want to look at just Korea. Let's look at everybody. So there they are. Um, if I right click on any of these uh, numbers in the number of documents column, I can sort them largest to smallest, for example. And here you see the breakdown by applicant nationality for all of the documents in the cube. Well, we can get a little more interesting than that. For example, we come to our more fields area and if I hover over applicant and then just click this down arrow here, I can choose a value filter, the top 10 value filter, and this is just going to show me the top 10 items uh, for the number of documents measure that we've already got on the screen. So I'll just click OK and it will do some thinking, but I need to do one more thing. I need to actually select the applicant as I've done by checking that box. So here you can see it's now telling me the top 10 applicants in terms of number of documents and this could be either late open applications or issued patents um, from each country. I'll sort within the countries to get a bit more sensible breakdown and you can see the breakdown here. So the United States, uh, you'll recall, was first, Canada second, Switzerland happens to be third, and so on. We can further uh, filter the information. The issue date dimension, for example, might again be interesting here. So I'll just check the box to add the issue date dimension on rows and it's taking it a moment or two to process. Uh, remember that we've got a lot of uh, uh, documents in there, over half a million. Again, it's recalled that we've looked at the issue dimension before and it remembered that when we did that, um, we had chosen 2006, 2007, 2008. Maybe that's not what we're interested in though, so we can go back and pick some different calendar years. Maybe what we would like to look at is cases that issued in 2011, 2010, 2009. So I'll click OK there and it'll take it a moment to chew through over half a million um, documents and uh, via the cube and redisplay the information for us. But here you have it. Um, maybe you don't like that particular order of the display. Maybe you'd like to see something more like this. I'm just going to drag issue date up and put it on top of applicant. And we'll see the display reconfigure in a moment. Just wait for that to come through. Again, it's having to reprocess well over half a million records. There we are. So now we can see uh, the rankings for each of the indicated calendar years. And we can scroll down and see them country by country as well. 
or maybe you would rather see a display something like this. I'm, I'm just dragging the issue date dimension away from the rows and I'm putting it on the columns and so now maybe this is a more convenient display as far as your own information reception requirements uh, dictate. Uh, you, you can have it your way as it were. Let's now try some other interesting things. I'll just get rid of these, drag them away, and uh, go back to the top again. So here we're back to the beginning. Let's now have a look perhaps at the average time required to prosecute a Canadian patent application. Um, you may know that uh, prosecution of a Canadian application does not begin until the applicant specifically requests substantive examination and pays an examination fee to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. So it's important to keep that in mind. You don't want to look just at uh, uh, the time between filing and issue. Well, you can if you want. But in the case of this particular measure, and it's right there, average years in prosecution, I'll just check that, uh, what this measure is looking at is the time span between the date on which examination is requested and the date on which the Canadian patent is granted. Let's uh, bring in some dimensions because th this number by itself is meaningless. Don't uh, put any stock in that number yet. Let's instead go and get, well, for starters, we'll bring in our document dimension. I'll just check the box there. And if we're talking about prosecution through to issue, really it only makes sense to look at issued cases. So let's restrict ourselves to the C kind code, which is to say issued Canadian patents. And let's also bring in that issue date dimension again. We'll look at uh, the calendar year version of that. And again, it's remembered that we were looking at those uh, three years, the last time that we manipulated the issue date dimension. Now, let's um, add a further dimension on the filter this time. Let's bring the applicant by nationality dimension in. And you can see we've got all nationalities chosen here. But we can play with that. We'll just open up the filter and We'll deselect everything and we'll come down and choose, well, since we're looking at uh, Canadian patent data, let's choose Canada. So this reconfigures to show us um, the average years in prosecution for each of these three calendar years of issued Canadian patents having uh, Canadian national uh, nationality indicated uh, as the applicant. We can do that for any country that you might be interested in. Um, in perhaps in, excuse me, perhaps instead of uh, Canada, you might be interested in uh, uh, Germany. Well, there's Germany and uh, the numbers reconfigure. Um, the applicant dimension might not be of interest to you, though. Maybe what you're really interested, and so I've removed it from the filter just there, uh, maybe what you'd rather see is a breakdown by IPC classification. So in this particular situation, we're seeing all IPC classifications for the indicated three years of uh, issue date of Canadian patents, but we can drill down and maybe you're only interested in um, uh, classification uh, level C. Well, if I click that, there you can see the uh, average years in prosecution changes, but of course you can drill down. So how about um, you're only interested in uh, C09? Well, there, there you go. And you can drill all the way down through all five levels of IPC classification for 
any of the displayed classifications. So I can, I'll just expand a few of these so that you can see what I mean. Now, as I drill down, you might notice that not all classifications are necessarily displayed. Again, what we are seeing is the only the data which is actually represented in the cube. Um, you may have heard of the so-called Toronto Pronto. There are various mechanisms for expediting uh, prosecution of a Canadian patent application. One way is to uh, file a special request together with a $500 fee payable to uh, the commissioner. And let's see if we can gain some insight into um, how the Toronto Pronto might be being used. Well, to do that, um, I'm going to get rid of the classification restriction. I'll just drag it away from the filter and let's just pick a single year. I'll, I'll go down and pick, how about uh, 2010? So we're only looking at calendar year 2010. And let's bring in the applicant dimension just scroll back up to find that. Here is the applicant dimension. I'll drop that on rows. And we want, right now you can see it's, it's looking at Germany. Well, let, let's go back and look at uh, Canada. In order to change it, we'll just come back up here. I will deselect all countries, scroll down, pick Canada. So here we are, it's reconfigured uh, to show us uh, the average prosecution time for Canadian uh, patents issued in calendar year, oh it's 2011 I see that I that I chose. Um, well we can open up the Canada filter here uh, port, uh, excuse me, we can expand Canada and then I'll just resort that largest to smallest and here you can see all of the um, uh, data for individual Canadian applicants and then you can just scan your eye down the average years in prosecution column here as I'm dragging the mouse to see if you can see any uh, noticeably short years. There's one there. Um, this corresponds to Husky Injection Molding Systems LTD. Two years to prosecute. That's not uh, dramatically lower. Um, maybe if we were to try a different year. Let's just see if we can go back to 2010. See how the results pan out for 2010 instead of 2011 and immediately things get reconfigured. Again we can go down and eyeball the columns here to see if we can see any dramatically low uh, numbers here. Here's 1.3 Sidance Corporation. Maybe they are making use of the uh, expedited examination provision, although not necessarily. We cannot tell for absolute sure if that's what's happening here. Um, it's possible. There are various explanations that are possible. Uh, um, this applicant might be filing in a class assigned to a SIPO examiner having a relatively low workload compared to examiners assigned to other uh, workloads and therefore that examiner can handle his or her cases more expeditiously or possibly the cases are exceptionally well drafted and involve highly novel and inventive subject matter which invites first action allowance. Uh, we don't know but you could check uh, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office's file wrappers to check that out. The point is that the information is here and it would give you perhaps a head start on where you might want to go to have a look. Um, I will remove those and we will do maybe one other demo. 
um, or maybe one or two. Let's take another look at classifications. Um, let's just go into the classification dimension and you can see that I have pre-configured some so-called top counts here. So I can just check top IPC classes uh, and, uh, excuse me, groups. And you can see, there they are. I can just sort them, largest to smallest. And this, of course, doesn't come out the correct total. Um, remember that we have a total of 539,115 documents represented in the cube, but here we're looking at just the top 15 uh, in terms of uh, IPC um, classification. Um, you may not be able to remember what any of these happen to be, well, I've built in a feature which uh, lets us quickly check that. I've just right-clicked, for example, on H04L12. Uh, so if we come over here, I can look up uh, the IPC group. It'll just go over to WIPO's uh, classification database. And there we are, data switching networks. Uh, and you can do that uh, for any uh, uh, level of uh, the IPC classification system. Uh, whether it's group, subgroup, class, subclass, etc., all of that uh, will work throughout the uh, cube. You can uh, re remember, as I demonstrated earlier, you can uh, uh, display a pivot chart if you decide you'd like to uh, chart this kind of information, that sort of thing. And you can slice it uh, by dropping in date dimensions, uh, applicant, inventor, whatever you might like. Um, one final demonstration here, when the Canadian Intellectual Property Office uh, publishes uh, a document, it includes a so-called process status code. Um, I'll just show you one example of how you might want to make use of that. Here we are back to looking at our documents measure. I'll go find the um, publication dimension, and I'll just drop that on rows. As we see here, um, on columns, I'll put in our document dimension again. There it is, document by kind. I'll just drag it down and drop it here. Um, it remembers that the last time we looked at it, it uh, I'd restricted it to issued kind codes only. I'll bring back all kind codes. But then, now we want to see this process status dimension. So I'll grab that and drop it on the filter. And if I open up the filter and expand it, I'll just drag it out here. These are all of the uh, process status codes which the Canadian Intellectual Property Office has chosen to indicate in the XML documents that it publishes. So the one that I might be interested in here is the so-called dead application uh, process status code. You may know that if a Canadian application goes abandoned for over one year, it's impossible to reinstate it. So looking at dead applications, uh, uh, can be important depending on what your particular circumstances are. Um, now, notice this is not telling us when these cases went abandoned. The actual date of abandonment is not provided in the data published by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Uh, in order to illustrate that factor, what I'm going to do, you can just see that we've got 71,869 documents represented here. I'm just going to get rid of the publication date dimension and I'll bring back a different dimension. Let's say for example the examination request date dimension. Here it is. There you'll notice we've got the exact same number as we saw before with a different uh, date dimension. Uh, again, these are dead cases, but we are not seeing their dates of abandonment. This time we're seeing the distribution by calendar year of their examination request dates. Um, 
you might notice this interesting um, uh, uh, row here. Maybe you think that this is an anomaly, calendar year 9999. Um, in working with databases, one often encounters so-called null values, which indicate an absence of data. In constructing the data warehouse on which this cube is based, I arbitrarily assigned 31 December 9999 as a placeholder for null dates. That obviously impossible date tells us that in this particular situation, examination never was requested for any of these 47,000 plus cases. However, that does not necessarily mean that these cases went abandoned for failure to request examination. Since the actual abandonment date is not provided in CIPO's data, it's just not possible to tell via this cube exactly how many cases go dead each year, but we can glean some information. That concludes the demo. I hope it's been of some interest to you.